I've never been surrounded by that many microphones. There isn't a right or wrong way to record the piano. What I would do, uh -huh. I'd take the lid off. So I got to spend a day recording piano music with a legendary audio engineer and an insane setup. So we're recording this so that it will work both in stereo and in immersive. I'm going to share with you the best insights for audio recording given to us by Alan Meyerson, who's Hollywood's most notable mixing engineer with decades of experience mixing the soundtracks of the biggest blockbuster films and top tier recording artists. Not only am I going to show you what we did with this elaborate setup at the Village Studios, I'm also going to show you how he helped me set up two microphones that I own that are much more affordable to record my piano at home. As all musicians know, recording is tough, whether it's the music side or the engineering of it. But by the end of this video, I assure you, you'll have more tools in your toolbox to help you with your next recording project. These, what, to get a perfect one now, will cost you $25,000. I might also be going broke in the near future as I suffer from gear envy, you know, wanting to buy new microphones and such. But in the meantime, I'm going to reveal to you fascinating details behind the recording process that are often hidden from the public. Are you ready to rock and roll? Sure, why not? Section one, at the Village Studios. So I've never been surrounded by that many microphones, ever. Sometimes you have more mics than you have source. Okay. Because you're micing, you're not really micing the instrument, you're micing the room. Now, right, come here for a second. I know we have a lot of mics up, but really what we basically have here are a couple of perspectives. So with this particular setup, we have three perspectives made up of 11 microphones. First off, these five microphones that are focusing more on the piano itself. These four that are capturing more of the room and these two in the back that are also capturing more of the ambiance. A lot of the techniques I get, I, I model off of people who I respect. This is a technique that uh, I became aware of with the recording by this engineer named Richard King. It's not the same, but it inspired it. Here's a clip of what the piano sounded like with this setup. So much of the magic happens in the tiniest little details and adjustments that are being made by everyone in the studio. What is the jazz miking? So you're getting a little bit closer, you're getting a little bit more of the hands, some of the hammers, some of the strings. Modern jazz, it's still in stereo. If it was older jazz, it would be a mono mic. Ah, okay. Definitely put that in the video. <laughs> After a day of experimentation, it was so interesting to see Alan switch gears to adjust the mics to fit a more classically oriented sound. Usually for classical music, we use a lot of small capsules. Mm -hmm. Imagine dropping a pebble into a lake. And if the lake is this big, the entire lake is going to excite pretty quickly, right? Mm -hmm. You drop it in and you'll see all the waves. But if you drop it in a larger lake, you do that and it takes time for it to get out. So for classical music, where nuance is everything, mm -hmm. you know, small capsules make the best choices a lot of the times. But in this case, these large capsules are particularly sensitive and they're not that far away from the instrument. It's really amazing how different the piano can sound based on different microphone placements without changing the microphones themselves. Let's now hear two examples back to back from some of the takes that I did with Alan. The first one comes from a closer mic setup and the second one is one with the mics further out. Also, what I think might be interesting is to share with you a clip from the last time I recorded on the same exact piano in this space. So the piano was recorded, of course, with completely different microphones, but it's still hard to believe that this is the same piano in the same space. Anything's possible. And that's really, so my only change here was to just get a little bit more spacious, a little bit more concert mm -hmm. hall-y than I had it, which was a little bit too intimate okay. for the stuff I thought we'd be recording. Section two, performance adjustments. One of the things I recorded was some new music that I just finished writing a day before this recording session. Mm -hmm. 
So I did three takes of the piece and with each one, I think I got closer to what I wanted. And the reasons for doing more takes is sometimes not as obvious to the average listener. Sometimes we need to redo takes because of simple note blunders. But other times, the quote-unquote mistakes are less obvious. Here's one that Alan noticed more than I did. That high E is just popping. Should I play it softer? A little bit softer would be, I think you, when you hear it, you'd agree. I certainly didn't feel piano and it, you know, it didn't feel balanced with the rest of the chord. And the most important thing, in my opinion, is the general feeling. Let's have a listen to the opening of take one versus take two. If that sounded exactly the same to you, listen again and pay attention to that last chord. So the point here is that sometimes as performers, we tend to focus on note accuracy and cleaner takes, which is very important, of course. But if we just stop there and use that as our guiding factor, we might miss out on the opportunity to have a more expressive take. Section three, recording at home. Around two years ago, I was really having trouble recording my piano at home. And trust me, even you all noticed in the comments. No matter what I was doing, the piano sounded so dull and I was about ready to buy new microphones or get more work done on my piano. This is when Alan graciously came over and helped me find a setup with the equipment I already owned. And I've been using these guidelines ever since. So the way sound works is if you have parallel walls, uh -huh. the sound just bounces back and forth and back and forth and then it radiates up and now you have another parallel wall and that's going to radiate back down and all of these sounds arrive at the microphone at different times. Those build up to become certain frequencies that aren't necessarily very musical. The room in your situation here isn't an advantage to you. So I wanted to, I wanted to remove as much of the room as possible. This is a really warm piano. So with a really warm piano, I can get a little bit closer to it. You know, where the two harps cross, mm -hmm tends to be the sweet spot for the for the low end. So I angled the mic more. What happens when you angle a mic more is instead of it seeing a narrow area, it starts spreading out. So it's seeing a little bit more of the low end. And then this guy is just sort of your melody mic. So all of your top end hand stuff. Don't be afraid, you okay. can't break it. Okay. You can play with, oh, it's a little bit brittle sounding, move this back a little bit. I'm not a, a wizard and I don't really know what I'm doing, so. So, you know, feel free to play with it. And now here's a quick tip on how to EQ for a setup like this. Cut a little bit in there and then make, and then compensate by adding a bit of warmth to it. It just takes away a little bit of that. I use the word mung. You almost always exist between 300 and 500 cycles. It's like if you were to put your hand over the, you know, mm -hmm. and talk. So after Alan helped me make these adjustments, I've been using the setup for the past two years or so. You can see examples of this throughout my YouTube channel. And speaking of which, please subscribe if you haven't already and give a thumbs up on this video if you are interested in topics like this one. You may not own the same type of microphones and the piano that I have, but I think these tips can be applied to many different piano recording scenarios. The way I am right now at this very uh -huh. moment, what I would do, uh -huh. I take the lid off <laughs> and I would do the Niels Fromm thing because oh, really? that just sounds phenomenal. I had recorded that piano 200 times, uh -huh. the one at Warner Brothers, and that's the first time it ever sounded good to me. Maybe you should do that. No, no. Section four, summary. My main takeaways from all of this are the following. Number one, match the sound quality with the type of music. Have a vision for the whole package because the character of sound plays an important role in the expression of the music. Number two, experiment. Both with your performance and with recording techniques, experiment with a few different options so that you can make comparisons. Number three, mic placement. If you're in a great space, capture some of the room ambiance. And if you're in a space that's less ideal, capture more of the instrument and do what you can to eliminate the sound of the room. Number four, 
don't have a singular focus. With each new take, don't just focus on accuracy, for example, but take into account atmosphere, dynamics, touch, tempo, and timing. Furthermore, communicate with others around you so that you can exchange feedback. Number five, having great gear is always a plus, but it's not everything. There are always ways to improve the quality of your sound with equipment you already own. Recording is stressful, but also such a beautiful art form. And I hope some of the things that I mentioned will give you ideas on how to better prepare for and experiment during your own recording sessions. Thank you so much to Alan Meyerson and his team, Jeff Greenberg and the Village Studios, and to Harry Gregson Williams. If you'd like to support this channel, I've included a link to my Patreon in the description below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you very soon in the next video.